Welcome everyone. It's great to see all of you here. I'm Jonathan Fung, a professor in the School of Physical Sciences and one of the organizers of What Matters to Me and Why. And it's one of my great pleasures to welcome you to the first talk of this academic year. So What Matters to Me and Why was started in 2012. So we're actually now starting our ninth year. For those of you who have not attended previously, the goal of this series of talks is to give faculty and staff a chance to reflect on what matters to them and why, and share their thoughts with the UCI community. Speakers are basically asked to say whatever comes to their mind on this topic, and they have often talked about their deepest motivations and beliefs, their views of their roles at UCI, and also their personal histories and basically what's made them who they are. The talks have become a remarkable glimpse behind the curtain, if you will, of those who through their daily activities uh, either working, learning, teaching, et cetera, help make UCI what it is today and have built community, which I think uh, we didn't realize back in 2012 how much this would be greatly needed and appreciated uh, as we've kind of gone into this COVID era. So one nice thing about uh, what matters to me and why is that it brings together people from all across the campus, all schools, all departments, as well as undergrads, grad students, faculty and staff. And so it's our tradition when we have these in person to give people a chance to introduce themselves to each other, just basically say hi to whoever's sitting next to you. Clearly, this doesn't work so great right now, but as a poor substitute, we thought it would be nice to try to sort of mimic that and break this large group into small groups for a few minutes. So in a little bit, through the magic of Zoom, you will all be sent to breakout rooms of about four people each or so. Uh, there you should be unmuted, and we hope you can just introduce yourself as you would if you were sitting next to one of these people. Maybe tell them uh, a bit about your name, your department, uh, where you are at UCI, whether you're a student or a staff member or a faculty member, and uh, maybe how you heard about this talk. So uh, I'll warn you this won't last too long, okay? It'll just be for a minute or two, and you'll get a little warning on your screen when it's about to stop. But if you could, then just uh, take some time to do that. Uh, and then we'll bring you back together and we'll get started with introducing our speaker. So let's go to breakout rooms now. OK, so now I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. So Professor Joel Veenstra wears many hats, far too many for me to explain or just even summarize here. But he is professor of teaching in the drama department associate chair of production and co-head of the stage management program at UCI, and also a professional stage manager, production manager, producer, and improviser. In his professional roles, he has coordinated collaborations and productions with renowned regional theaters, including the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Pasadena Playhouse, Laguna Playhouse, uh, and many others. And he's also worked with many other well-known organizations, including, for example, Cirque du Soleil, and has uh, organized events with luminaries such as Tom Hanks and Rita Moreno. Here at UCI, uh, in 2013, he conceived and has actually annually produced since then um, UCI's Kultik Comedy Festival, a free four-day comedy celebration for the community with over 30 performances and workshops. Uh, he's also produced a series of documentary shorts exploring the art of improvisational theater. And he's especially well known for his devotion to teaching and mentoring. So for example, I know that he uh, at some point took 50 students and faculty all the way to Las Vegas for a backstage tour and, and meeting people of Cirque du Soleil. Uh, that must have been an incredible trip. And his work has also been recognized by numerous awards. And in 2015, he was named the Student Organization Advisor of the Year, which is a remarkable achievement, especially given that there are over 600 student organizations on campus. And in 2018, he received the UCI Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Fostering Undergraduate Research, given in recognition of outstanding work in mentoring uh, undergraduate students engaged in research and creative activity. Before just letting him start, I just mentioned our personal gratitude to Joel. As many of you know, um, he was scheduled to talk in March, um, but the campus closed down just one day before his talk was scheduled to go forward. 
And so we are really grateful that he was willing to reschedule for this new academic year uh, and in this new online format. And uh, I must say, who better than to have a professor in the drama department and an improviser, no less, to roll with the punches to kick off this uh, new year of What Matters to Me and Why online. So thank you, Joel. Really appreciate your joining us today. And we look forward to your talk now. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Really appreciate the kind introduction and for this opportunity, especially one of the first speakers in this new uh, remote format is really an honor. And uh, I would really appreciate the, the What Matters to Me and Why series as I've learned so much from it over the years. As you mentioned, I was originally scheduled to give this talk about my personal journey back in March. And I, I just have to laugh because at the end of my bio for this talk, I had this line, Joel, he ensures that the show does indeed go on. And then my talk got canceled. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you kind of got to roll with things, as you mentioned. So uh, that's kind of how the world works sometimes. And so uh, as I was contemplating what matters to me, it's, it's a kind of a big question if you really want to delve deep into what that question means. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of informed consent uh, before we start here, because uh, this is, I can guarantee you, going to be a happy talk. There, there's a lot of joy in this talk because that's my world. Uh, but also it's going to delve into some mature topics. And I want to share uh, a trigger warning for those who might have sensitivity to suicide, food scarcity, or trans identities, which will be referenced in this talk. So just so that you know what we may be touching on before we go there. But again, in the end, like a good story, it's going to get a little bit dark, but then it rises triumphantly to, uh, to an end. Uh, and we'll share that journey together. All right, here we go. While I understand right now that we are in a pandemic, people are dying, the entertainment industry is paused and thousands of people are out of work, and the economic impacts of this whole situation are profound and challenging yet to be fully known. It doesn't certainly seem like a gift to so many people in so many communities. And yet I struggle with this tension of that reality and another reality that I've been experiencing. Namely, for me, this has been a welcome pause. My spouse works as a psychologist and for, at one point in their career was working as a psychologist in a prison. And so many of the inmates would come to them and say, this has been the best thing that happened to me. The best thing that happened to me is coming to prison because coming to prison, I was able to get the opportunity to, be so, to get sober. And this pandemic has moved me towards a path of sobriety. To clarify, my addiction is not so salacious as drugs or sex or alcohol, but it's rather something a little more insidious, work. Before this time, if you had asked me, how you doing? And in fact, for the past 20 years, uh, my spouse can vouch for this. Anytime somebody asked me, how am I doing? My answer would always be busy, so busy, so very, very busy. Oh my goodness, I'm so busy. And yet this is a blessing in some respects because I've been blessed to have an amazing career in the arts. Uh, not everyone has the opportunities that I've had and I'm so immensely grateful. And I always seem to think next season I'll slow down. There'll always be, but you know, the challenge is that there's always something else exciting to work on. There's always new opportunities that are coming up and collaborators that I work with me and just unique things that are like, oh, that sounds fun, let me try that. And it's so, so hard because I love my job. I love what I do, both in the realm of entertainment and education, it's spectacular. I, I can't imagine a better place to be than where I'm at. And I love that I get to be a part of a transcendent, tactile and immediate art form known as theater. I love that I get to work with some of the most creative people in some of the most unbelievable spaces. I get to thrill people's hearts and souls as they engage in the moment that we create together. As theater artists, we create, inspire, provoke, affirm, and challenge the status quo. The stories and experiences that we ch share are always transformative if the hearts are open, are in our audience and in ourselves to that experience and the openness to the empathy to see someone else's journey as our own. And the lessons of theater in all its forms, including improvisation, which is near and dear to my heart, can be applied to other arenas as well. For example, the transformative properties of theater can echo in the transformative properties of life. Theater is all about growth and in life we're all on a journey. We can make mistakes, 
we, we, and we will make mistakes, but hopefully we're consistently learning as we try to develop and to share together and to grow together. And when the lights dim at the end of the night, we can rest assured that the curtain will rise again and the journey will continue. It's amazing, amazing to be a part of this work. Another example of the lessons of theater in life is while the audience loves to watch a show and what's happening on stage, for me, the most interesting thing is what happens backstage. Is there any wonder that I married a psychologist? Like seriously, this is just what I'm into. We have this present version of ourselves on stage and what's going on and what we share with people, but what's going on backstage behind the scenes in our minds is what's really important because that's what really makes everything work. It's what makes our world tick and how we engage and see the world. In the theater, we have this phrase, the show must go on. And this can be an unhealthy mindset for our field where individuals prioritize the production over their well being. And I am grateful that in this pause, we as the entertainment industry are examining this and other unhealthy and inequitable aspects to promote change to have a more balanced return. However, for a stage manager like myself, the idea of the show must go on was really never about keeping the performance going for an audience. The important thing for me on stage is the one aspect of the show that truly must go on, the most key element to a show, and that is the people. How do we take care of the people that are on stage? How do we take care of the people that are backstage? So that during a performance and after the performance, when the lights dim, we can rest assured that the people will be there when the curtain rises again. So sometimes there needs to be a pause like right now. For example, if someone gets hurt or sick mid-show or a piece of equipment doesn't function properly, we have to call a show hold. We stop the performance to make sure that the most important part of the show can actually go on and perform another day. That people are taken care of in terms of their needs and their well-being so that the work can continue. This shift of the lens and awareness is a key part of my role as a stage manager and as a person. I have to make sure that the people are taken care of on stage that I'm helping to manage and helping to guide along this process of doing our work together. Within my role as an educator, it's another aspect of what I do. I'm so blessed with the opportunity to show my students the possibilities within this field and the unique opportunities that by experiencing them through my teaching and through my example. In the fall, as Jonathan mentioned, of 2018, I was able to take 50 students uh, and community members from UCI backstage, a number of Cirque du Soleil shows in Las Vegas, uh, collaborating with uh, a wonderful graduate student of mine, Eric Smith, and I had a chance and a number of other collaborators because nothing happens alone within the theater. We only work in collaboration. It's a necessity to do anything. I think it's true of the world as well. Uh, but I've, that was an amazing opportunity. I could never have dreamed that we would have been able to facilitate that, and yet we were able to facilitate that. I've had a chance to work on multi-million dollar productions with huge stars and a number of celebrities on absolutely amazing productions doing things that seem mind-boggling and unable to, to possibly ever happen. I would have never dreamed of these possibilities and yet I've had the eyes opportunities. I'm so, been, so blessed and I'm just in awe and amazement at these opportunities that I've been given, especially in light of where I came from. When I was young, I distinctly remember thinking, I want to work in the arts, but where are the arts in Michigan, which is where I grew up? I really just didn't see a pathway there forward. And I didn't think I'm never going to go to California or New York or Chicago. Those just seem outside of the realm of the possibility. It just didn't seem an option for me when I was young. In fact, if it wasn't for an educational institution like UCI that I went to, Calvin College in Michigan, I would never have believed that I'd have actually had a chance to actually work in the entertainment industry. And if it wasn't for mentors and guiding people to me that said, you know what, this is an option, this is a possibility, I never would have believed it. I never would have taken chances and risks and tried to go out on faith that this could have been a possible path for me. In fact, it was so unheard of a concept in Michigan where I grew up that earlier in my career, my grandmother thought, Joel, you must be, uh, you can't be making a living off of entertainment. You must be a drug dealer. I was like, what? I'm not a, no, I'm not a drug dealer. I wasn't a drug dealer. Uh, I'm a work dealer. That's what I do. I deal in work. I enjoy work and I work all the time. I, I love dealing with that uh, constantly, historically. However, sometimes to the detriment to my own health. 
because I had the wrong lens about what it was about for the show to go on for myself. And that's a part of this process is being aware and thinking about how do we engage with others, but how do we also engage with ourselves? So I love what I do. I love my job. And I'm grateful for this moment in history that has allowed me to pause and reflect on how I approach this work and what I'm teaching the next generation. I love so much what I do, but now I'm trying to set some boundaries to take care of myself and to take care of other people that I love and care for. Let me tell you about some of the other people that I love. I love my community. They matter to me. I love my community so much. And I get to work with, again, some of the most creative people on the planet, and it is a joy to do so. I love my colleagues in the drama department. I love my colleagues beyond in the greater uh, theatrical industry and entertainment industry. I love my students. I love my church family. I love UCI. You all know CI, UCI. It's an incredible community. You are a part of it. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm so glad that you've taken the time to, to come be a part of this series and to learn more about us in this community. <laughs> Historically, one of the reasons that I would come to this session is that there would be a free lunch. So I'm sorry we can't provide you a free lunch today, but uh, hopefully it's still worthwhile for you and your experience because you're learning about your community and the people that exist in our world together. Community is so important. It helps us grow. It helps us to see our boundaries. It helps us to see the world beyond ourselves. The truth is that we need community to discern the truth of what our world is a little bit. Because if we only look through the lens of our own eyes in the world and our own viewpoint and never consult with anybody else or never look beyond ourselves for more feedback frameworks in terms of seeing the world, then we're only resting on our own perspective and our only lens, which can sometimes be a little muted or a little off focus. And so we don't wanna close ourselves off from the beautiful complex mosaic of diverse perspectives that exist in the world. So much innovation happens in almost every field from the convergence of divergent concepts, different ideas that come together to make something unique and incredible. Like peanut butter and chocolate, Reese's, spectacular, two different things and they're amazing. All of theater is a byproduct of this, this concept of different disciplines and perspectives collaborating together to craft into one singular vision. And oftentimes the more diverse the ideas and the more diverse perspectives that are coming together, the more exciting the project becomes. Not necessarily easier, but more beautiful and more rich because we have to wrestle with the diversity and differences that we have within each other. If we get too focused on the rut of our own agenda or our own lens or what's in it for me, we are unaware of the impact that we're having on our broader community and how we're potentially harming or hurting our neighbors. We have to consider how we care for one another and how to be aware of when we might be doing something that hurts somebody. It's all about relationships. Community is about how do we connect with each other and relate with one another. In community, we can grow, we can develop together. It's not gonna be perfect and there's gonna be tensions and there's gonna be paradoxes and there's gonna be negotiations in terms of how do we maintain trust, respect, and love for one another, even when we disagree. But that's what it is all about. It's the negotiating those things, being aware of where we are and what is, and what could be if we listen to one another and are there for one another. There's a paradox of pain and brutality and despair that exists within the world and hope about possibilities and struggle to change the world and what might be possible if we're all committed to making change and being open to one another. And this change first and foremost comes within our own hearts because ultimately change starts within each one of us and how we exist in the world. Certainly there are systematic challenges and historical injustices that have happened. And those things need to be addressed and need to be highlighted. But the starting point for thinking about change and with the world that we wanna be is ourselves and our own actions and how we engage within the space. But again, if we only rely on our own experience and don't value others' perspectives, we're gonna be limited. We're just gonna be in this framework of our world as we understand it. And we'll be unaware of the challenges that others are facing. A phrase that my other grandma used to say is that every home has a heartache. You are likely aware of the heartaches or hidden battles that are going on inside yourself, but you may not be aware. In fact, well, you're likely not aware of what's going on in other people when they're struggling but everyone is struggling in some way. Everyone's fighting their own challenges. 
And how do we engage with one another to help care of one another in this complexness in the world? It's exactly like a stage production. When there's so many different elements, we need different people with different lenses and different points of views to come together and listen to each other and be kind to one another and listen to actually what's being said versus what we think is being said. We need to take the time to share space with one another through the ambiguity of uncertainty that is relationships and community building, listening, building and moving at the speed of trust. We can grow together, we can build together, we can connect together, we can love together and make something magical like theater or a community. My diverse community has helped me to overcome so many things and they are one of the key reasons why I'm here today. Now let's take this sense of community a little bit closer to my heart, which is also a little bit of a paradox. My family. I love my family. I am married, I have two amazing boys. I love them so, 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 so much. And yet, after six months or so alone in the house together, it can drive you a little nutty. I could just use a little break sometimes. Oh, boy, could I use a break sometimes. Uh, and yet, uh, I love them to death. Uh, I have two sons. One is a three-year-old, one is an eight-year-old. Uh, they're slightly off in terms of engagement with one another. And so they need a lot of engagement for myself and my partner. And it takes a lot of energy. Oh my goodness, we try to do the online school for them. We, I try to teach remotely. Uh, I'm confident that uh, a week has not gone by without them joining one of my Zoom sessions. In fact, it's a miracle that they're not joining my Zoom session now, half naked, running around. Uh, it's remarkable. We'll see though, the, the, the presentation is still young. It may still happen. Uh, so, uh, but that's happening. I'm teaching my partners, seeing clients remotely. It's a lot, it is a lot. And yet I love them so much. And I really realize especially in this moment of pause and reflection, how much I miss them and how much I love them when I'm working 17 hour days to make think productions happen and things happen. I've discovered that in this pause, one of the richest joys I have is when I can snuggle up and we all are together on the couch together. We share stories or play games together. It's just a beautiful thing. It's that human connection that's just so rich and so valuable. <sighs> It's amazing, the power of human connection with those who you love. And in fact, one of the richest connections I have with my partner, and I specifically use that word partner rather than wife now, and I use the pronouns they, them to talk about them because words matter. And in the past few years, there's been a shift in our family identity. As you're on life's journey, if you're open to learning from the community around you, you begin to learn about the broader world and your vocabulary and knowledge and perceptive perceptions expand, as well as your empathy and understanding. And in the past several years, my partner realized something that was pretty profound for them and really transformative for them. And it was that they didn't feel like they fit within the binary gender norms within the world. If you don't know what that means in today's world, traditionally individuals are identified as either male or female. And my partner felt like they didn't fit in either of those two categories. And if you look at the research that exists within this world, in, these, in this realm, sexuality and gender identity is more accurately reflected as being on a spectrum than a black and white binary. It's just not this or that. There's, it's a range that people exist on in a number of different categories that I would highly recommend you look into if you're not familiar with, because it's more complex than we can know uh, if you haven't had experience from it. Just like our world is more complex as you go into study different topics and different researches, there's a lot of information to be explored in any different specific topic. Well, for my partner, they felt that the shift in language and how they were defined and how they're referred to was something that more accurately identified them and actually was very holistic and life-giving in, the, uh, in how they were existing in the world. And so it transformed their existence just by shifting the pronouns to they and them. And they shifted their name to Tiger, which I love, it's a great name. While this shift fits very much with William Shakespeare's phrase, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. The language sh shift has helped them feel holistically better and seen in the world. So how could I deny them that? 
how could I not celebrate the whole person who they are at the core of it, essence who they were as a person? Who they were as a person in and of themselves had not changed. It was just the realization of who they were holistically. And I loved them, even though they changed some of their language frameworks. And they were still nevertheless the person that I fell in love with and the person that I met so many years ago. This is different than how I would have responded to this unique situation about 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I was in a space where I grew up in a very conservative faith community. But before I go into this backstory, I wanna note that I believe my love of my work, my love of my community, my love of my family, all stem from a central place. And that is that I believe I'm loved by God and I love God. I am an active person of faith and my relationship to Jesus Christ is tremendously important. And God matters to me because God has taken care of me through every step of my journey. And I would not be here today, I'm confident without God's guidance. I've literally seen miracles in my life of God's providence taking care of me in my life, in my children's lives and the person that I met and fell in love with. One example, oh my goodness, my oldest son. My oldest son is awesome. And one day he came up with an idea. He said, mom, dad, I would really like a baby brother or sister. Oh, would I like a baby brother or sister? And we were like, nope, we're good. One, one is enough. We're good with one. We only need one, we're happy with one. And he said, but mom, dad, I really, really want a baby brother or sister. And being a, a, a household of faith, he said, hey, you can pray about it if you want. My son prayed for months, nonstop, every single night. Please, 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 God, please may I have a baby brother or sister. Please, please, please. Now, don't get me wrong. My partner and I tried nonstop to talk him out of this. We offered him toys, vacations, a better college option, uh, not having to share so many things. Uh, we said, hey, you can have a dog. Do you want a dog? We could get you a dog. And he said, no, I want a baby brother or sister. Please, please, please. They kept praying. So my partner and I were like, oh my goodness. This is, this is something, especially after two months of every night praying. And so uh, we said, you know what? Here's what we'll do. We'll provide one month and we'll see if we get pregnant. Uh, considering, especially for Benji, it took a year or so before that worked out because surprisingly having children is a little bit more complex than you think. And so it was a long process and we thought, oh, we'll, we'll give God one month and we'll say to Benji, hey, we tried, God said, we don't, we're not doing this. That's how the answer to prayer is coming and that's what it is. And he was okay with that and this was our plan. And wouldn't you know it, the next day, the literal next day after we made that decision, we were pregnant. Like it was, unre it was remarkable. I, I am convinced it is a miracle. And as a result, we have a beautiful son uh, that is just such a joy to our family, even when we're all in lockdown. Theo is spectacular and I love him to death. Another example, when I was young, it's unbelievable because where I am now is just such a different space to where I grew up. Uh, growing up in a, a single parent home with three brothers, we were actually not, not super well off at all times. Some might say poor and, and we were on food stamps. And in fact, there was one night, my mom tells this story, uh, which is really profound to me of a, another miracle that we experienced in our life, which is uh, for several nights, we didn't really know what we were gonna have for dinner. And one night my mom looked in her purse and she had $1 and she had nothing left to feed us for dinner. And she prayed, dear Lord, please, please, I don't know what I'm gonna do, help me. And then we went to the store and there was 12 ears of corn for a dollar. And she paid that price and we each got three ears of corn in our four family household. And it was amazing. I love corn to this day, but it was remarkable. And that's one of many stories. There's another story of another night where we didn't have food for dinner and there was a knock at the door and somebody was there, nobody was there actually, but there was food on our doorstep and we were able to eat. And it's, it's amazing. Uh, yet another example of a miraculous state of affairs is again, 25 years ago, my perspective on what it meant uh, was more so defined by this conservative community than what was actually an active understanding for what it meant to be loved by God. This model was somewhat about 
25 years ago was about how can I fit into a certain set of norms or a certain set of rules and was less about relationships and how do we engage with one another as well as our God. And there is a way in which the world was defined in which God wanted your, the world to be one way within this conservative space. And then if you didn't do it that way, then you're on the outside. You're not acceptable. You are pushed away and just not in the mix uh, and kind of just pushed aside. And so if in that time period, I would have met my partner who is identifying as part of the LGBTQ plus community, I'd have been like, nope, goodbye. And it's especially unbelievable because like a lot of trans people, my partner is more spiritually attuned than most. And in their life, Christ is abundant and inspiring and they continually inspire me on my faith journey. And the beauty of our relationship and the miracle of our children and the world that we've crafted together, it would not have been impossible. And the experiences that we've had for the last six months cooped up together would not have happened because if I would have limited my thoughts on what I thought was true and important versus seeing what was truly important, what truly mattered. And by God's grace, this happened now in our lives versus when we first met and where I was first on my journey of understanding and where they've been on their journey. And now I feel more congruous in our relationship and I'm so happy to love them and to be with them. And I'm so happy to understand that God's world is more dynamic and diverse than our own limited perspectives. If we just observe the world. I mean, you look at the world right now. You, I mean, if you look out the window right now, wherever you're at, or look around the room where you're at right now, just look at the, the spectrum of colors that are around you. It's unbelievable. We are in such a beautiful space. We have such beautiful, elements. We have such a diversity of relationships and people that are in our world. The world is so complex and the story of the world is complex and the people of the world are so complex. And if you look at the nuances of the world, it's a complex place. There are not easy answers. They're not simple yes, no's, right, wrongs can, entirely. There are some frameworks, but we need to be mindful about those frameworks in a broader context. And when you think about people that are on the spectrum of sexuality and gender identity, there are sorts of nuances that people sometimes dismiss as being too complicated to engage. But if you think about that, a thing is too complicated to engage, then what you're saying is you as a person, if you're engaging with this, you're too complicated to even be bothered with. And so I'm gonna devalue and just not engage with what your situation is. And it's really disheartening. And some people I've heard as well say, you know, this sort of identity issues and elements are confusing and we don't want to talk about them. But again, imagine you're that person to be told that your existence is too confusing to be dealt with. We don't have time for you, which is a total lack of valuing for that person. So I'm th thrilled and grateful. And I think it's miraculous that I have this holistic lens. I'm so blessed with this abundant life with this person who's unique and yet matches me perfectly. I feel literally like we're Legos. We're like a perfect match together. We just fit. And the Lord continues to sustain me. And I, I can't explain it. I can't. It, there's too many paradoxes in terms of how it works. It's hard because I look at the world and there's so much inequity. There's so much brutality. There's so much ugliness in the world. And yet there's so much potential for beauty and acceptance if we listen to each other and open each other and find, follow the model of grace that is clearly in love that's clearly written in the Bible and being open to one another. I don't know why. I don't know why, why I've received so many blessings and some people haven't. Why, I mean, certainly there's systematic in, injustices, but on a, on, a, on a large scale framework, why, why am I in this space? Why have I been in this world and some people haven't? Why has certain status structures have been built around me and who I am versus some not are not? And it breaks my heart. It, it breaks my heart because I know that I've been blessed so much and it's just so remarkable. And, and I've been through so much. And the fact that I have this family and this job and, and I'm in this world and you know, uh, I've been very close to a lot of people who've struggled and I've tried to be helpful for them. I've had people very close to me die by suicide. I've had family members extremely close to me die from cancer. And for some reason, when I was young, I thought I'd never reach 40. I'm well past 40 now, but I thought that I would not live past 40. For some reason, that was a thought in my head. And I had some very suicidal thoughts when I was younger. And yet I've been sustained by the Lord to this point. And I don't know why me versus others, but I know and I'm confident that God has sustained me. And I, so I keep being here. I keep trying to be the light that I can be and try to be encouraging and try to change as an agent of renewal. And sometimes I fall short and I make mistakes and I stumble, but I keep trying to spread love and being a light and try to make this place better because I love it because it matters to me.
and you matter to me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a part of this world. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. And I hope you can see the appreciation that's being expressed <laughs> on the screens. And I, I think I speak for everyone here. Thank you, you for sharing so deeply and openly in your presentation. We, we now have a time for questions. So um, please uh, feel free to ask. And I know it's kind of sometimes a bit of a hurdle to do it online, but I really would ask you to um, overcome that obstacle and, and go ahead and ask questions like you would in person. So you can do that by clicking on the chat at the bottom and just typing them into the uh, box that shows up. That would be fantastic. We can find those. Alternatively, you can um, click on participants and then you should be able to see a raise hand feature. If you raise your hand that way, um, we will be able to uh, see your name will sort of rise to the top of this big list and we will, uh, well, Joel will be able to call on you. So I would invite you to do that. And, and the last, of course, if you want, you can just raise your hand uh, in real life <laughs> and we will do our best to uh, see you uh, among the hundreds of uh, little boxes here. <laughs> So please, if you have a question, please go ahead and, and share. Thank you for all the gratitude. I love all the thanks. Open <laughs> to questions as well, but boy, it warms my heart. Thank you so much. K2, you had a question. Yeah, no, I just wanted to comment and say that it was such a beautiful presentation, very heartfelt and kind of reminding us all of the things that matter most in our lives, you know, people who are close to us, but you're also so remarkable in terms of how you mentor our students and you know everything that you do within the department. So it was a beautiful kind of coming together of the personal and your work life and taking a pause right now. I think that's a beautiful way to think about you know, how we can focus on our own wellness, which a lot of us lose track of you know, in this kind of working world. So thank you so much for being my colleague in drama. And I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Kitu. Thank you. Uh, somebody asking in the chat, how do you see the future of live theater changing through this time? And how do you, how your relationship to it will change? Oh, um, you know, I think there's a lot of conversations in terms of wellness uh, that is happening in terms of our span of day and how we do things. Uh, and I'm, I'm, excited because there are real examinations of how what we're learning now in this kind of pause that can be applied beyond this. I know for a lot of my colleagues up in Los Angeles who are actors, the fact that they can audition for a piece of, of whatever they're working on, whether film, television, or theater, that they can uh, just pop into a Zoom meeting or send a self-tape and they don't have to drive an hour across town, audition for like 10 minutes and then drive another hour off town. So that's not really great for your day and your wellness. And so thinking about that framework and those shifts is, are uh, something that I think will be an outcome in terms of, do we need to have meetings together in the same way or can this be a good meeting framework? I think there's also questions of accessibility that are happening as we think about uh, audiences like a broader audience as well as a diverse audience, especially uh, different economic uh, individuals and who we're serving within the theater that is really getting examined in this framework. And then there's also this element of inclusivity that uh, is really being wrestled with in our community. There's a, there's a movement called, which you might find interesting, called We See You White Theater. That was actually helped started by one of the UCI alumni. And uh, it's exploring how all the regional theaters and all the theaters in America can actually try to be more inclusive versus just trying to be on the surface inclusive in terms of actually engaging and having deep representation amongst a wide variety of people in their theaters. So I'm hopeful that all these things that we're thinking about will help move us forward. Uh, that being said, I'm also cautious in the time frame that's going to take to get us back because safety is always a primary concern. It's a primary concern of the unions and I and sadly it's not always a primary concern for the artists. But I try to emphasize that with the folks that we're teaching that you want to think about how do we take care of ourselves. Uh, it's almost like the uh, mantra that you hear on planes when we used to all fly, uh, where you put on your own mask before you put on somebody else's mask. So we got to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves in a holistic way, but then helpful can helpful help other people. So I'm hopeful that uh, that it'll 
just revolutionize the way that we're working and try to be more inclusive, more accessible and healthier. Um, that's my hope. Thank you, Joel. Joel, I think there were two uh, people who raised hands. I, can, I don't know if you can see them, but Caitlin maybe was first. Yeah, Caitlin. Yes, um, first I wanna say thank you. Um, I, I come from political science, which is a much different environment than y'all in drama and arts. Um, and I guess my question though, is I found the way you described your journey today, beautiful and very engaging, particularly for someone who also identifies up faith. And I guess my question is, how do you um, open up environments, particularly um, educational environments to allow a similar engagement with students? Because sometimes that can become toxic really fast, um, particularly in like a super um, divided time as we're living. And so I guess, yeah, just as an educator, what are like tips you would have for supporting an environment to have those conversations? Yeah, great question. For me, there's an element there that I'm that I'm I'm reading into it. So this is my own framework. But there's assumptions and biases of when somebody says I'm a Christian, I'm a person of faith, that some people can um, can assume that they know what that means. Uh, but that's the same type of assumptions and biases that happen amongst all identities, right? We all have our thoughts about what it means to be trans, what it means to be black, what it means to be Indian, what it means to be uh, Asian. We have all these biases of, of what we're bringing to the table. Uh, and I think step one is just trying to be authentic that this is who I am. It may not be exactly what you've seen in the media or seen in your experience. I'm, I may be different than that. And for me, uh, the aspect of faith is integrated into everything I do. So even though I don't speak about it often, uh, people have said, have, have heard about my faith and uh, often the comment I hear is, oh, that doesn't surprise me. Because just how I engage with the world is one that tries to be holistically be respecting and loving of people, which I think is central to the Christian faith, which again, different people's experience. And there's been a lot of uh, religious trauma that people have experienced from people of faith uh, and different faiths. And, and so I try to push against that, uh, that I think, uh, inaccurate representation based on the way that I exist within the world. Uh, I also try to be just open and say, this is who I am. And if you have questions or concerns, you can come to me, but I'm not gonna push or force because I don't feel like my faith needs to be a dominant tactic where I'm going to subdue anyone into my belief system, but I'm gonna have an opportunity to say, hey, this system works amazing for me. I've been so blessed uh, and it works. It works for me in terms of my life and God has taken care of me. So I just, that, that's my path. Thank you, Joel. There's another uh, hand raised, David Namey, and then maybe uh, several in the chat box you can look at. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Oh, good, thank you. I appreciate your talk. Um, one thing that uh, struck me uh, early in what you were sharing was the, that you value improvisation. Um, and I see a lot of value in that as well. And I, I wanted to get a sense from you where you uh, have the opportunity and you introduce improvisation into your faith and also into your family life. Outside of just your work, I imagine it's there as well. Uh, I have a niece who went through the MFA program at UCI as a drama student. And I know that she's worked that into her life as a parent. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you've worked improvisation into your life. Oh my goodness, David, every day is an improvisation. We're constantly trying to figure out what's going on, especially <laughs> with my young kids. They're like, what are we doing today? We always got to have to respond uh, to them and engage with them. Uh, and, uh, you know, con the improvisation is a construct we sometimes think about as purely theatrical or, or purely a comedy. Uh, and for me, it actually drills down to the conceptual nature of, of improvisation uh, in terms of what it is and how it, it helps us actually to build and create and engage with uh, one another and how do we listen to another and, and build also community because uh, it was kind of born out of the work of uh, Viola Spolin who uh, in Hall House in Chicago would help bring divergent communities together and kind of talk to each other and try to create art together and theater together and uh, and so it, it aligns really well in terms of my work. I also think a lot of my uh, my teaching is somewhat improvisational because you never know what the students are going to ask and you have to kind of ebb and flow with that. Uh, and it, I also, again, align it very keenly to my faith because I 
feel like there's truths within the world that align with with the gospel and the good news of, of what Jesus brings to us in terms of listening, being present to one another and, and uh, building trust with one another that sometimes gets uh, misconstrued uh, in terms of how people engage with people of faith. And to me, it's about opening the arms and, and being loving. And that's what improvisation is about as well, is how do we lovingly work together to create something in the moment? Mm, very nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. See a few questions in the in the um, chat box. Uh, it's such a diverse time, uh, divisive time. Sorry, thank you. It's such a divisive time. What do you think is the role of theater in breaking down those divisions we are seeing? Uh, theater is a, a great teacher of empathy. Uh, it's great when you can see theater and see these things and empathize with them in terms of what's going on on stage. It's even more powerful when you can get people to participate in sharing different perspectives and being engaged in the creation process and being aware of different uh, points of view in the process of creating theater because it, it asks people to think outside of themselves, especially the different roles within theater. So I think it, it has a lot of potential. Uh, and I think it's, it's exciting to think about this as a, a possible tool to bring people together. I mean, there's all sorts of performance groups now that go in and are teaching uh, diversity training and performance models, sexual harassment training in these models. I've got an organization called the Applied Improvisation Network that I'm a part of that uses improvisation that goes into a wide variety of different companies and organizations to help them work on a variety of different topics from team building to listening to collaborative work. And so it's a great resource and possibility uh, for options. Uh, there's a few other questions. Jonathan, I want to be mindful of time. Can we, can we take one or two more or shall we, uh, do we need to wrap this up? I think we started a little late, so maybe we can take a few more, um, but probably should end in about uh, two or three minutes. Wonderful. Uh, is there a book or play or performance on improv or other source which you would find yourself returning to again and again across your life that grounds you and helps center you and inspire you? Uh, you know, uh, as I look at that honestly, it's not about books for me, it's about relationships. And so people help ground me. Uh, my partner grounds me in some tremendous ways. Uh, my uh, collaborator in the drama department, Don Hill, does some great grounding of me, which I appreciate. Uh, my uncle, pa uh, Pastor Bill, who's on this call, grounds me in many ways. My mom, who's also on this call, my family are big supporters, I love them, uh, grounds me in several ways. Uh, and so for me, it's all about people that ground me uh, in both my faith uh, and uh, it's spectacular, uh, more so than text. Uh, texts feel a little static to me. I guess that's maybe my improvisational framework. I want things that move and change. Um, uh, curious, uh, what brought you to the realm of art education as opposed to simply uh, just producing art? Uh, my grandma was right in some respects. Uh, it's a hard field. It's a really hard field. Uh, and uh, I, uh, like some people, uh, wanted to have a family and wanted to have a stable family. And so arts education, I mean, I'll, I'll just be blunt, spoiler alert. Uh, arts education is a one of the most uh, secure uh, entertainment options to do. And so, uh, especially here at UCI, I am overwhelmingly blessed to be able to teach and engage the next generation, but also do research and do work within this field externally. So. The fact that I can do both is spectacular and the security of the employment uh, really brought me here. Uh, and so, and, and I knew that I wanted to do this at some point, uh, but again, I was just blessed that this door open. So, uh, question, uh, as a recovering workaholic, what do you recommend from your experience to others who find themselves at the balance in regards to the work and hurting their health and their relationships? Uh, the best thing that I've done uh, is, is creating boundaries in my day. So uh, there's times when I'm gonna work and there's times when I'm not gonna work and accepting that I'm gonna disappoint my own self and my perfectionism and maybe some of my colleagues because I'm not gonna be able to get everything done every day. And so being aware that there's only so much time in the day and I could work as I've sometimes done in the past, uh, 21 hour day trying to get all this stuff done the next day, the bucket's going to fill up again, and it's going to want me to do more. And I just need to say, this is when I'm working, and this is when I'm not working. And focus when I'm not working on family or on whatever thing that I can engage with within that moment. 
Uh, another question, what do you recommend to do after doing an audition and receive the news of rejection? How do you continue to build confidence throughout those difficult times? Uh, I encourage uh, my students, because uh, I do also teach a generalized uh, theater class as well as some improv classes, is to be mindful that you inherently have value. Uh, and this again comes out of my faith that each one of us are created and, and with a very special purpose and a plan. And that is different than uh, and each one of us, every one of us, no matter what we believe, we have an innate value and we have a uh, purpose and a special reason to be here on earth. And so I encourage you to kind of tap into that and be mindful of that and know that that's different than your craft or your art form. Even though you're inhabited within the same body, auditioning, not getting the part, getting rejected, it's not you getting rejected, it's your craft or your job that's saying, you're not right for this reason and you're not right to be any number of reasons. Maybe the casting director blinked at that particular moment when you're giving your best moment. And just by the nature of the uncertainty of time, you uh, you didn't get the part. Because casting is really difficult and it's really kind of one of those things that I equally do not understand. Uh, some of my friends in the film industry say it's you're doing the headshot lottery when you audition. Because literally you got all these people that look similar and one person's gonna get the role and everyone else isn't. But knowing and centering yourself in the fact that you have value, you're important, you're loved, and your community around you love and support you, your family love and support you is the key element there. Okay, well, thank you, Joel. I hate to cut this off because the Q&A is one of the best parts, but um, really appreciate your talk and, and also to all the people in the audience who ask questions, thank you for that. And before we close, uh, let me just mention a couple of things. Uh, you will all be receiving a questionnaire in the mail, uh, your email. And so I hope you go take the few moments it takes to fill that out. We really value your feedback. Also, we have several other talks planned. Um, some of you might know we have an alumni series where UCI alums come back and reflect on how their um, student experiences you know, made a difference in their career paths and their life journeys. So the upcoming talk there in the alumni series is November 6th. It's going to feature Dr. Jose Mayorga who's uh, currently the Executive Medical Director at UCI Health Family uh, Center, Health Center. And then on uh, November 18th, uh, we will have our next speaker in this uh, main series. Uh, it's a talk that's uh, jointly sponsored by What Matters to Me and Why and also UCI's Phi Beta Kappa chapter. The speaker is Mike Arias, who will tell us the fascinating story of uh, how he was hired at UCI as a clerk in the copy center and then retired 40 years later as the chancellor's chief of staff, the highest ranking staff member on campus. So uh, I would encourage you to sign up for those. All these talks, of course, are listed on the What Matters to Me and Why webpage. And so I encourage you to check that out and also uh, watch for the registration emails that'll be coming out. So uh, with that, let me just close. Thank you, uh, Professor Veenstra, once again, for such an excellent and moving, uh, deeply moving talk and uh, for setting us off on another great season of uh, What Matters to Me and Why. So uh, thank you, and to everyone, we look forward to seeing all of you uh, in the coming months.